So he understands that. So it's going to be different than uh, in years past. We'll be able to take your kids and all that. So praise the Lord. If you have your Bibles, let's open them up to Matthew chapter 21. And uh, as you guys are finding your way to Matthew 21, let's pray and ask God to bless our time together. Father, we thank you, Lord, so much for this morning. We look forward to what you have for us in your word. And God, what a special day this is. A day that you set aside from the beginning of time where you would ride into Jerusalem presenting yourself not only as the king of the Jews, but also the king of the Gentile as well. And so, Lord, I pray that as we celebrate this Palm Sunday and we celebrate what you did, Lord, again, just pour out your spirit on us, God. Open our eyes to your word. Be our teacher. And I pray, God, if there's anyone here today that doesn't know you, that before they leave, they would make that commitment, that they would come to know you for real. And we thank you again for this time. We look forward to what you're going to show us. And uh, again, Lord, present yourself to us today as well. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, again, it's going to be interesting interesting today. As we look at Palm Sunday, we're going to start out in Matthew. We're going to end up in Genesis. So when we're done with Matthew, we're going to jump back in Genesis 22. But again, what we look at today is the king arrives for Jew and Gentile. And I kind of feel an emphasis on Jew and Gentile just because, again, um, just all that's been going on here with the nation of Israel recently and, the, and, and how God, the Bible says, in the last days is going to pour his spirit out on the Jewish people and draw them to himself. And again, you see God working among the Jew and Gentile to bring them one as family. And that's God's desire. Again, the Jews rejected their Messiah 2,000 years ago and their eyes have been blinded up until this point. But again, the Bible says in the last days, God's gonna pour out his spirit on them, open their eyes, and they're gonna receive the Messiah. You know, it's interesting. Uh, the stand that we've been making for uh, the Jews uh, in this area of our local community here, um, they're very appreciative of that. So much so, um, that many of them have said they want to start trying to pop in on church services, maybe even come to kinships, which I said they're welcome to do. And this prayer thing we're going to be doing on Monday nights is going to be happening. Some of them have asked if they can come and join us to pray for Israel at our prayer group here at the church on Monday nights. And we made it very clear to them that we're going to be talking about Jesus as the Messiah. We're going to be praying for the salvation of the Jewish people. We're going to be Calvary Chapel. And they said, we still want to come. Amen. And so God is doing a work. Yes. Now... I'm not, speaking for, I'm not speaking for all of them, and I'm not saying, I'm just saying that God is working in hearts, and I think what they're seeing is, is that we love them, and that's the thing, is that God wants his family to love each other. We're one family, and again, when I say Jew and Gentile, again, that includes everybody that's non-Jew as well, and this whole thing with Jew and Gentile, but again, we call this Palm Sunday, um, because this is the day that Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the donkey, declaring himself as the king of Israel, and also the king of the Gentile, and the king of the world. Now, we know that he came the first time as a lamb to die for the sins of the world, hence coming in lowly on a donkey, which was uh, the animal of peace that kings would ride in on, as opposed to a stallion, which was the animal of war that a peace would ride in on, uh, that a king would ride in on. Uh, but, but this is the day that Jesus presented himself, knowing that he would be rejected, um, but showing himself to be the savior of them and of us. And it was all predicted to the day. This is the amazing thing about this, guys. Look, as we go through this passage, if you're doubting, is the Bible truly the word of God? Um, is it supernatural? If you see the passage we're going to cover today and the passages we're going to cover today and you don't believe that the Bible's supernatural, you're simply blinded and can't see. No man could write what we're going to look at today. No man could predict what we're going to see today. No man could make happen what we're going to see happen today, even knowing what the scripture says because you'd have to make everybody else play their part. So this is a very supernatural thing that God has done, not just to save mankind, but he's made it so crystal clear to mankind that this is something God is doing that anyone that rejects is simply going to be choosing not to believe what is right before their eyes. Again, as I said, this was the day that was prophesied to the very day. Daniel chapter 9, um, again, predicts the exact day that Jesus would ride into Jerusalem. And had the leaders simply known the day that Daniel predicted, they could have been waiting on their Messiah. So it was a day that he rode in on that was literally prophesied thousands of years in advance and again, um, Jesus had warned them they simply weren't prepared. Again, the reason it's called Palm Sunday, as we said, as he was riding in, uh, people were waving branches. And this was a sign that the king was arriving. If a king was coming in, a conquering king, you would wave all these branches to celebrate the conquering king coming in. Rome did this on a regular basis. When they would conquer, they'd come back into their cities and everybody waved branches or whatever. So when the people of Israel were waving these branches as Jesus rode in, they were saying, this is our conquering king. And this is one of the reasons that they stumbled at Jesus, because they believed the Messiah was going to come and take over the world and rule and reign. And by the way, he is going to do that 
at the second coming. What they missed was, is the first time he had to come as a suffering lamb, the Passover lamb to pay for the sins of the world. And so while they were looking for this king, the lamb came and it stumbled them. And so they weren't ready for that. And that's one of the reasons they rejected him because he didn't take over the world as they thought that he would. And indeed, as he will, uh, when he comes back the second time. Now, it's interesting when Jesus wrote in, he wrote in four days before the Passover, four days before they would sacrifice the lambs and four days before he was crucified. Why did he do that? Again, some of you remember the history. What you would do is on Passover, you would bring a lamb into your home four days prior to the, to the offering. Now, the kids must have loved that, right? You'd bring the lamb in the home and the entire family would examine the lamb for four days. Kids playing with it on the ground, the parents seeing it from every angle. The idea was after four days, you're supposed to be making sure that this lamb is spotless. There's not a single spot on it. It's ready to be sacrificed and acceptable unto God. Now you see the picture being fulfilled here. And we're going to see a lot of pictures fulfilled here today that God gave us. And one was Jesus now rides in four days early to be examined by every member of the family. Uh, that is, you know, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the Essenes, every group, even the Roman government was to examine him. As a matter of fact, he stood before Pilate. And Pilate said, I find no fault in this man. And so the idea was, the Gentiles found no fault in him. The Jews found no fault in him. He was the spotless lamb, and now he was able to be sacrificed for Jew and Gentile. And that's what this is all, uh, all about. Uh, Paul says in Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. So no one's excluded. For the Jew first and also for the Greek. And notice for the Jew first and then the Gentile. And again, that's exactly why the Lord, how the Lord presents himself today. Now, why did he do that? Because the promise came first to the Jew. He gave it to Abraham, and he, he's not going to be responsible to fulfill it first to Abraham and then to fulfill it to the Gentiles. So we're going to see in Matthew 21, him coming to the Jew and then also showing that he came for the Gentile uh, toward the, later on in the chapter. First of all, to the Jew, look what it says in chapter 21, verse 1. It says, now, when they drew near Jerusalem, that is Jesus and the disciples... And they came to Bethphage at the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go into the village opposite you and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. Now again, notice the two. Remember that. The two that he sent to get the donkey, that'll come in later when we get the full picture out of Genesis. He says, now if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, well, the Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. So if anybody tries to stop you, just say the Lord has need, and, and they will be sent. Probably a prearrangement here by the Lord. It says, all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, tell the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. How much more clear could the Lord be? Now, notice what he's done. First of all, the exact day prophesied in Daniel to the day that Jesus would ride into Jerusalem. He's now riding in on that day. And had they known their scripture, they would have known that. And then on top of it, he tells them not just when, he tells them how. He's going to come in on a donkey, not as a conquering king yet. He's going to come in as a king for peace. That is, he came the first time in peace as a lamb to die for us. He's coming the next time as a warrior on a stallion to take the world over and to deal with his enemies. And so the prophecies here and, and, and the, the sheer uh, uh, you know, impossibility of this taking place without it being supernatural, again, already overwhelming, and there's so much more to go. And so, he, he, again, he prophesies, this, this is how it's going to be. This is how I'm going to come in. And notice verse 6, so the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them, and they brought the donkey and the colt, they laid their clothes on them, and they set him on them. Uh, all, and a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Now, this would be the same as rolling out the red carpet. Again, when the kings would come in, they would take these, uh, their, their clothes and put it on the, uh, on the road, you know, so they could ride over the top of their clothes and their branches or whatever else as they're waving the branches saying, you are worthy and, and here's your reward. So remember, the crowds were gathering and they were chanting to the Lord as he was coming in. Notice others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And then the multitudes who went before and those who followed out afterward or those who followed cried out saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Now again, note this. Here's another prophecy. It's not just the day predicted, the way predicted. Now the thing the people would be saying as he rode into Jerusalem. And, and again, Hosanna, what does Hosanna mean? It means save now. 
So the crowds were saying, you are our Messiah. You are our Savior. Save us now. And again, as I said, this is probably one of the reasons they didn't believe him because he didn't save them politically and take over the world like they were expecting, but he was there to save them spiritually and to save them from their sins. And again, this is taken again from the Psalms. Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Um, expecting the Messiah to take over. And again, he's not going to do that yet. Now, what's really exciting about this too is as he was writing in, again, remember, he was going to be acknowledged. God said, when, when, when my son rides in, he will be acknowledged as the king. So the, somebody would be shouting out. God made the people shout. They might not have even known why they were shouting, but they're shouting. He said, if, if you don't cry out, the rocks will. And the really cool thing about this is, is that the priests at this time, as they were in there getting prepared for all their sacrifices, they were around the altar quoting this very same scripture, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And I wonder how they were doing it. Was it rote? Was it without any real emotion? Was it kind of Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord? Just doing their religious duties, right? And all of a sudden they hear the roar of the crowd outside louder than they are. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They had to be, what in the world's going on? At the same time, on the eastern gate where Jesus ended up going in, we're going to see in just a moment, clearing the temple, you had up on the upper gate and then at the lower of the gate, the priest would be there also declaring another messianic prom, uh, prom, not prom, another messianic psalm, and be saying, you know, again, uh, open the gates and, and let the king come in. The king of glory is coming in. So all these messianic prophecies and psalms are being proclaimed. All these prophecies are being fulfilled at this very moment, and it was an overwhelming move of the spirit that was happening in the city. And notice it says that, verse 10, it says, and when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, who is this? The word moved there is the word seismos. It's where we get seismic. And that's what we speak of with large earthquakes and things that shake the earth. Now, it's not saying there was an earthquake here because there's no indication there was. It just means the spirit of God was moving in such a powerful way, everyone was just shaken. You know, what is going on? This guy's coming in. Everybody's waving branches. They're declaring all these messianic prophecies. Uh, everything, I mean, this is just, and you can feel the Spirit of God moving in a powerful way. And so now he has officially presented himself to the nation of Israel as their king and as their Messiah. But it doesn't stop there. And aren't you glad? I'm glad because now we're going to see he reveals himself to the Gentiles as well. Look at verse 12. It says, then Jesus went into the temple of God and drove out all who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables and the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. Now try to get this scene in your mind. First of all, before we get to the scene, it wasn't necessarily wrong that they were selling these animals. That wasn't the point. What they were doing was they were selling these animals at exorbitant prices. To have sacrifices on the temple or nearby was a good thing. You had to worship God by the sacrifices. The problem was what the priests were doing was is they were rejecting people's sacrifices. When they would come there, they'd say, well, that one has a blemish, that one has a blemish. Well, there's nothing wrong with this. No, I see that, I see this. But we have one that's freshly ready to go. It's, been, it's kosher, it's been approved. You can buy this one. And they would charge exorbitant prices. And so they were stealing from the people. They were robbing from the people. If that wasn't enough, they also were taking up the area that had been set aside for the Gentiles. Notice what the Lord says when he goes in there. He said, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, and you have made it a den of thieves. That is, you're stealing from the money. You're charging exorbitant prices. Again, and, and God's going to clear them out. It wasn't just the fact they were stealing, but it was also where they were. Guys, note this. The Gentiles at this time were not allowed to enter into the temple. Only the Jews could enter into the temple. Now that the veil's torn, it's Jew and Gentile, and Jesus has paid for all. But at this point, a Gentile could not go in. The Gentiles had to worship in the outer court. It was the, called the court of the Gentiles. And if they were going to go and worship God and, and bring praises to God and bring sacrifices to God, whatever they were going to do, it had to be in the courtyard area. But their place to worship God had now been taken away from them. The, the religious leaders have set all their tables up and selling all their animals and all their crooked business. And what the Lord is saying is, look, not only are you stealing from the people, you've removed the only opportunity that the Gentile has to come and seek me. So not only are you deceiving the Jews, you're robbing the Gentiles of their ability to worship me. And now you see why the Lord was so upset. Now, again, this scene must have been amazing. I'm not going to take a lot of time on this, but try to get the drone footage of this in your mind. Uh, you know, again, the, the, the history tells us there was during the feast times about 100,000 people at any time on any of these days during the Passover on the Temple Mount. So imagine 100,000 people on the Temple Mount. That's Nayland Stadium, by the way. Now imagine one guy comes in with a whip and cords and starts 
turning over tables and whacking you know, everything, and everybody begins to back up and clear out, and the power of God is there backing him and supporting him. By the way, if anybody thinks that Jesus was a skinny little wimp, you don't know the Jesus of the Bible. He was very much a man's man. By the way, we know that he was a stone worker and a carpenter as well. So he would have been very muscular and very strong. He was a man's man, and he goes in and starts clearing house, turning over the tables, scattering the people. And I try to picture what they was look, look like. I said, from the drone you know, footage, the people get, you know, getting back and pulling back as the Lord just clears everything out. He was in there to say, this is my father's house. Stop stealing from the people and allow the Jew and the Gentile to worship. Again, bringing the family of God together and just a powerful picture of what was happening in this whole situation. But notice what else I love because where else was it that the, 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 blind, the blind and the lame had to go? They, they couldn't go in either. You couldn't be blind or lame or have a blemish and go into the temple. Again, that wasn't because God excluded them and didn't love them. It was a picture of God's perfection and holiness that once was completed on the cross now shows that all are welcome to come to the Lord in any form and fashion, if you will. But the blind and the lame couldn't go into the temple. So the only place the blind and the lame could also worship was that in the court of the Gentiles. And notice the next thing the Lord does, verse 14. It says, then the blind and the lame came to him. So not only showing the Gentiles are welcome, but now those that have the, the, the defects, if you will, physically, they came to him in the temple and he healed them. So he's doing the work of God among the people uh, right in the face of the religious leaders. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, do you would think because it says he, they saw the wonderful things that he did, they'd be like, this, is, this has to be the Messiah. There's something about this man. But remember, they were only about themselves and they were only about their glory, not the Lord's glory. When they saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying out in the temple saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. And they said to him, do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, have you not read? I love this. Jesus, have you never read? He would challenge these guys that considered themselves the scholars of the word. Is, have you not even read your Bible? I love it. He says, out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants, you have perfected praise. And that is, they're going to praise me because God's spirit's moving them. And that's where it's perfected. And notice that he left them and he went out of the city to Bethany and he lodged there. And so, again, what a beautiful picture here. He clears the court out. He shows a place for the Jews that should be there to worship, a place for the Gentiles that should be there to worship, um, and, and gives this whole picture of what God intended the temple and the temple mount to be. And now we're going to shift gears and we're going to see the picture that God gave of this very event in the Old Testament. The Bible gives lots of foreshadowing. And, and pre-picturing, if you will, of things that God's going to do uh, later on. And we see that in the Old Testament. And one of the best ones in all of Scripture is right now, and that comes out of Genesis 22. So I want you to turn back in your Bibles to Genesis 22. And here's the setting. Abraham and Sarah, you remember, received a promise from God that God would give them a promised child, a supernatural child because they couldn't have children. Well, Sarah got impatient and decided she was going to help God out. We've never done that, have we? And so Sarah says, all right, let's go ahead and have somebody who'll come in. Hagar can be a handmaiden. That was acceptable in that day, not in God's eyes, but in the world. And so the world does it. So we'll adopt that and we'll let her have a child for us. And then we'll have this baby and the promise of God can be fulfilled. The problem is God came to, and Abraham should have never done that. Sarah should have never done it. But then God came to Abraham and said, you know what? That's not going to work. I, I didn't say I was going to let you do it another way. I said, I'm going to give you and Sarah a child. And it'll be a child of promise. It'll be a child of the spirit, not a child of the works of the flesh. Again, the whole picture here of the law versus the spirit and the works of the flesh versus faith in Christ. It's all being built in this whole picture here. And Paul speaks about it in the New Testament. But either way, he says, I'm going to give you a child. He's like, no, just can't, Ishmael, be it. no, it's not Ishmael. It's going to be you. And I'm going to give it to Sarah. And you're going to have a child. His name's going to be Isaac. And he's going to bring laughter. And I'm going to fulfill all my promises through him. So that's been the setting. And again, now we've seen that Isaac's been born. And they're rejoicing that they have this child of promise that God's going to bring all these things, a blessing to the world, uh, and a, certainly a blessing to them. And this whole picture is going to be built now of the father to the son and the sacrifice. Even as in what we just read, the father in heaven to the son Jesus Christ and the sacrifice of his son. And he's going to build this whole picture on a human level of the emotion that Abraham would have been going through, showing the emotion that God went through, the sacrifice of a son. Imagine sacrificing your child. Now again, God never intended him to be sacrificed, and God doesn't approve of human sacrifice. But God was simply saying to Abraham, do you love me enough to put me first? Do you love me enough to put me above even your own children? 
Do you love me enough to put me above your own grandchildren? That's a new, new, a new challenge for me, right? Do you love me enough to put me before your husband or wife or anyone else? Abraham, I know the answer, but I want you to know the answer, and I want to see where your heart is. And notice what happens. And at the same time, I'm going to paint a picture to the world of what I'm going to be doing down the road with my son. Let's look at it fall together. Look at chapter 22. It says, now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. Now, very interesting in the language here. It's not just like, hey, Mark, where are you? Oh, I'm over here. No, this speaks of an attention given to this phrase. That is, where are you, Abraham? Here and ready at, ready at your service. It's, it's someone ready to serve their master. What do you want me to do? Whatever it is, I'm gonna do it. That's what's shown here in the language. And that shows you, again, the heart of Abraham. And notice what it says. And then he said, take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Again, can you imagine Abraham's heart at this moment? Can you imagine after all these years and waiting on this son and finally the son of promise, after all the things that took place and God you know, telling him, I'm gonna use your son, I'm gonna do these things or whatever. He says, no, go take your son and sacrifice him. What was happening in Abraham's mind and Abraham's heart at this moment? I mean, this had to be an overwhelming uh, test for him. And again, I would say the greatest test that he ever faced, the offering of Isaac. He knew the promises of God for his son, he, but he, the Bible also tells us that he knew that if God put him to death, that God would raise him from the dead. Why? Because he'd made the promises. And Abraham realized, okay, how do we know that? Because it tells us in the New Testament where his heart was. Hebrews eleven seventeen. 17, listen to what it says. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, he offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, in Isaac your seed shall be called. That is not through Ishmael, but through Isaac. Concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. The Bible tells us in another place that Abraham understood that if he had to put his son to death, that he would rise, that God would raise him. Not only that, but again, that when he decided to sacrifice him and obey the Lord to him, he was dead that day. In other words, the moment that God told Abraham this right here in verse two, the New Testament tells us that Abraham said, he's already dead. That's how obedient he was to God. I'm gonna do this. You've asked me to, I'm gonna do it. What an obedient heart. But again, what a picture it gives us because now we're gonna see that three days later when the sacrifice is supposed to be offered, he believed that God would raise him from the dead. You see the picture being painted here. The son that was dead for three days and rose again after three days, although Isaac never did really die, figuratively in Abraham's heart and mind, he died at this moment. And figuratively in his mind, God would raise him again in three days if he had to be raised. And he certainly didn't know what Jesus Christ would be doing on the cross, but he knew what God was doing here. And it's interesting here, you know, God knew that he had two sons, but this was the son of promise, of faith and promise. And notice he also says, the one in whom you love. You know, this is the first chapter in the Bible we see the word love. And it's the first chapter in the Bible we see the word lamb. I find that interesting. Because as God is painting this picture of the father to the son, it shows the love of the father to the son and the lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world through Jesus Christ one day now being represented through this whole offering that is gonna be done through Abraham and Isaac. And so notice what he said also to him. He said, I want you to go to the land of Moriah on one of the mountains that I will show you. In other words, go, there's mountains all over the land of Moriah, but go there and I'll show you the mountain. And by the way, it's gonna be Mount Moriah where he's gonna tell him once he arrives that the sacrifice is to be made. Now, so that you can picture the land of Moriah and the mountain Moriah, I want you to see a picture. So we're gonna put the slide up and leave it up there now for the rest of the service. These are the mountains or the land of Moriah. There's only one of them that's Moriah. The, number one, the first one you see, that's the Mount of Olives. And then right there in the middle, that's where the temple is. That is Mount Moriah. And notice the marks show the boundaries of them. It goes up around the corner. And, and again, it goes to its highest point up to the left. You kind of see it curve up to the left and curve around and comes back down. That's Mount Moriah. And the other one is Mount Zion. So this is the land of Moriah, but this will be the mount that God is gonna tell him, this is where I want you, this specific place. And he's gonna give him a very specific place that he wants him to sacrifice or offer Isaac as though he would be sacrificed. And it's interesting to note here again, this, this land, Moriah means chosen by Jehovah. It means this is the place that I've chosen to, for my son to die. And this is the place where I've chosen you to represent that through the offering of your son that I will interrupt and not let happen because it's gonna be my son that's gonna do it. But guys, there's something else I want you to notice here. He says, go there and offer. 
And take your son, offer him. It doesn't say go there and execute him. It doesn't say go there and force him to do this. It says go there and offer. And the picture that God is giving is, is a father and a son that are both willing to do this in obedience. Even as the father was willing to give his son, Jesus Christ, Jesus was also willing to go to the cross for the joy set before him to pay for our sins. In the same way, Abraham, being willing to obey God now by giving his son, also Isaac was willing to lay his life down and let his father do this. You say, wait a minute, wasn't Isaac a little boy? I know we've seen that in kids' church and Sunday school, right? Guys, that's inaccurate biblically with the timeline. We don't know the exact age, but here's what we do know. At this time, Abraham was somewhere between about 120 and 130 and Isaac was somewhere around between 20 years old and 30. So get a picture. You've got two grown men here that are going to Mount Moriah for this sacrifice. Now, by the way, if Isaac did not want a 130-year-old man to sacrifice him, he wouldn't have been sacrificed, right? So this means that he allowed Abraham to bind him and lay him on the altar as though he would be sacrificed. That was a willing offering that Isaac did. You know, we think a lot about what Abraham did, and, 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 we, you know, and rightly so. You know, Abraham, good job. But I think about Isaac. What about Isaac when this whole thing takes place and realizing that I'm the sacrifice, I'm the one that's got to do this. We're going to see that he willingly did this, allowed himself to be bound and put on the altar, even as we're going to see that Jesus willing, willingly allowed himself to be bound and put on the altar. And notice he says also, go and offer me a burnt offering. Now, there were multiple offerings, peace offerings, drink offerings, grain offerings, uh, other types of animal offerings. And in all of the animal offerings, other than the burnt offering, you would take part of the animal after it was cooked on the altar, if you will, and you ate part of it. Part was sacrificed to God and part was eaten. And it was supposed to show that you were having a meal with God. It was fellowship with God and becoming one with the Lord. There was a symbolism that was done in the sacrifices, except for one, the burnt offering. The burnt offering the entire lamb or the entire animal was consumed. Nothing went to the other person. Nothing went to the priest. Every bit of it was burned up. He said, I want you to go, and this offering is going to be a complete sacrifice to me. Again, showing the picture of Jesus giving himself completely for us, the complete offering, the complete sacrifice, and now he gets ready to head on his way. Now, we don't know what happened on the ride, uh, the conversation. I'm sure that Abraham was probably very somber, probably very thoughtful. Notice what it says in verse four, then on the third day. So after three days, it took a three-day journey to get there. On the third day, um, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, verse three. I'll make sure I read verse three. So Abraham, that, I skipped a whole verse on you. I apologize. So after God tells him to go do this, so Abraham slept in. I would have been tempted to sleep in. And I would have been tempted to say, Lord, are you sure on this one? This is my son. I know you want me to give you everything. And, 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 and I'm, I'm, I'm starting to give more to you, Lord, but this is the most precious thing to me in the world. And see, here's where the real test comes in for the believer. All of us can give God something. But how many of us can really give God everything? And that's the challenge. That's what set Abraham apart. He said, I don't want to just give you something. I want to give you everything. And so I think, how would I have handled that? You know, I love Abraham. He didn't sleep in. He didn't say, God, could you give me a confirmation? Look what it says. So Abraham rose early in the morning, quick to obedience. And he sat on his donkey. And I told you this would come into play. He took two of his young men with him and Isaac, his son. Remember the two that he sent to get the donkey. Now we see the picture playing out in detail of what Jesus did on this day 2,000 years ago and riding in, even the two getting the donkey. Now the son being taken in with the donkey here, this whole picture that God is painting of Jesus riding into Jerusalem. Um, and, and notice this, he took them with him, Isaac, his son, and he split the wood for a burnt offering and he rose and he went to the place of which God had told him. Um, notice the split wood. We'll get to that in a moment. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and he saw the place afar off. So as Abraham is getting closer, he sees these mountains. And God now shows him which mountain it is, the one in the middle that he wants him to take his son to to sacrifice him. He lifted his eyes, he saw the place afar off, and Abraham said to his young man, stay here with the donkey, the lad and I will go yonder and worship and we'll come back to you. And so Abraham, notice this, now it's only the father and the son going to the place of sacrifice. Remember, all that loved him fled. 
And certainly we know the Romans were there. We know that other people were there. That's not my point. But in spirit and in heart, it was just the father and the son with Jesus there at that cross. And now we see Abraham and the son, the father and the son, going alone to the place of worship. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering, that is the wood that was split, and laid it on Isaac, his son, even as the wood was laid on Jesus' back, the cross, as he walked to the place of sacrifice. He put the wood on the back. Now notice this, it was split wood. It is to the detail of what God did with Jesus. You see, in the crosses in that day, you didn't carry the whole cross. They split the cross in two pieces. They put the cross beam on their back and Jesus would have been carrying the cross beam that had his arms out like this and they had the long part waiting on him at the place of sacrifice. And then when he got there, they would have put it together, bound him to the cross and then crucified him. So in picture here, we see now the wood being laid on the son's back. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and the two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father. And he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Look, the fire and the wood, but where's the lamb for the burnt offering? Again, it's still at this point he doesn't understand. And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself the lamb for a burnt offering. And God quite literally provided himself the lamb for the burnt offering uh, sometime later through Jesus Christ. And notice, so the two of them went together. Again, this whole picture of them now together at this place. And Isaac is beginning possibly to figure this out. And notice this in verse 9. Then they came to the place. Notice the word the. I have that underlined. It is a very specific place that God chose before the foundation of the world where this sacrifice would be done, where Isaac would be offered. The place of which God had told him. And Abraham built an altar there. Notice, placed the wood in order and bound his son Isaac and laid him upon the altar upon the wood. In the same way Jesus was taken to the place of crucifixion, they put the wood in order. They tied his arms to the beams of the wood because it wasn't strong enough simply being nailed through the wrists. And they nailed his wrists with the, with the nails in his hands and in his feet. And they put the wood together and they raised him up and he was offered as a sacrifice. I mean, to the detail. God is giving the picture to the nation of Israel and to us to see exactly what it was that God was doing and what's going on. Now, what's interesting to me is, uh, again, he, notice this, Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. Now, before we go on with that, where was this particular place? Guys, note this, again, Mount Moriah, again, whenever you did a sacrifice, what you would do with the sacrifices is, is you would go to the highest place of the mountain, and you made the sacrifice there. So when he came to Mount Moriah, he wouldn't have stopped at the Temple Mount. That, of course, is where David bought the threshing floor and where they built the temple and all that. There's a symbol for that and there's reasoning for that. But that's not where Abraham would have stopped. We know that historically. We know that, that, that in that day, they went to the highest point of the mountain they were doing the sacrifice. If you follow it up to the Temple Mount, go to your left where that little curve is and go to the highest point, guess where that is? That is Golgotha. That is Calvary. That is the place of the skull today where Jesus Christ died for the sins of the world. God literally had Abraham take Isaac to that highest point to the left up there where Golgotha is today to offer his son to show us that in this very spot, the exact place, the son of God will pay for the sins of the world one day near in the future. And we now look back and see that it's been done. Notice what it says. Abraham stretched out his hand. He took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. And he said, do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God since you've not withheld your son, your only son from me. You gave me everything, Abraham. You've proven yourself. And then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked and there behind him was a ram caught in the thicket by its horns. Remember, they took the crown of thorns and placed it on the Lord's head. And now we see the ram with the thorns stuck on his head. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. That is, Jesus died in place of Isaac, but Jesus didn't, didn't just die in place of Isaac. Jesus died in place of us, all of us in this room that deserve the judgment of God upon us. But rather than us being judged, he took it for us. This is what our Savior has done. And notice, and Abraham called the name of the place, the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. We now look at it and say, in the mount of the Lord, it was provided. He took care of it. Now, guys, something else amazing about this. Notice it was the angel of the Lord that called to him to stop. Guys, in Scripture, do you remember who the angel of the Lord is? It's Jesus. Don't be stumbled by that. The word angel is the word messenger in the Hebrew, and it means that when God speaks to mankind, he speaks through the voice of Jesus. This was Jesus 
presiding over this mock sacrifice. Jesus himself was there at Calvary with Abraham and Isaac watching what he was gonna be doing very soon played out right in front of his eyes and saying, don't do that. This is my job. I'm the lamb that God will provide. I'm the one that's gonna be caught by the thorns in the thicket. I'm gonna be the one that the wood's gonna be put together and nailed to the cross. I'm gonna pay for the sins. Isaac, you can't do it. I appreciate your heart. I thank you that you are willing to do this, but, I, but you couldn't have done it. Only I could do it. And so we see on the very spot that he does this here, the angel speaking, and notice, then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time out of heaven and said, by myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you've done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, blessing I will bless you and multiplying I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore and your descendants shall possess the gate of your enemies. So I'm gonna bless you richly for this. Look at the rewards of obedience to the Lord. In your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Again, why? Because through Jesus Christ, now everyone can be saved and go to heaven. So all the nations of the world are blessed through him. And so Abraham returned to his young men and they rose and went together to Beersheba and Abraham dwelt at Beersheba. And again, so this whole picture amazingly played out to a T um, here in, in, in Genesis 22. But if you notice something here, notice it says, so Abraham returned to his young men and they rose together and went to Beersheba. Where's Isaac? Isn't it interesting? The Holy Spirit mysteriously left out Isaac. Again, remember, God is painting a picture prophetically of what our future is gonna be for those who follow Jesus Christ. Now, certainly Isaac came back with Abraham. Certainly Isaac went on back to his home and was there at his home. But you know when the next time we see Isaac in scripture is? In Genesis 24, when he's joined to his bride, that is, his bride was brought to him by Eleazar, the Bible tells us, who was Abraham's oldest servant. Eleazar means the comforter. And the comforter brings the bride to the son who's already at his home so they can start their marriage and life together. Guys, exactly as the Lord said, he's gone to his home and he's waiting and the Holy Spirit is gonna take the bride of Christ in the rapture of the church and bring us up to the Lord where we'll be joined to him, his bride and him together and we're gonna go into the home together and have the marriage supper of the Lamb for seven years and then once that's done, the Bible says it's not gonna be the bride coming to him. Now the bride will be with him in the second coming, coming back and establishing his throne and his kingdom on the earth to rule and reign for a thousand years. You couldn't get a, a more clear picture of Jesus, the rapture, and even speaking of really the picture of the second coming. And so guys, we have amazing things to look forward to as we celebrate this week of what the Lord did for us in his life. Again, I want you to do that this week, to celebrate in what Jesus has done. Listen, this is something God, that was very painful to God. God wanted us to know how much it hurt him by even demonstrating to Abraham what he was asking Abraham to do. This was no small thing to offer his son, who, who, who we all have reasons we could be put to death, right? Jesus did nothing wrong. And so he wants us to know, I did that because I love you. I did that because I want you to be saved, because I want you to be in heaven with me. And guys, it won't be long. Right now, he's gone back to his home. He's waiting on his bride by the Holy Spirit to be brought to him. And although I know that's a picture of the rapture, it could be right now that the Holy Spirit is bringing some of you to the Lord right now as his bride. God is telling you in your heart and he's convicting you of your sin. He's letting you know that you need to give your life to the Lord. And the Holy Spirit is saying, won't you come with me? See, Eliezer went back and he said to the family, will you come with me? Will she come with me? And it's interesting, when you go read the story about Eliezer going back and wooing her, if you will, uh, wooing her to come back and to join Rebecca, to join Isaac, he gave her a choice. He said, look, God has set this up. God has made this happen. There were all kinds of miracles that confirmed that those two were to be together. Again, there was so much that happened. He shared that with the family and the family said, well, let us ask her. Come on out. And Rebecca came out and they said, will you go with him? And she, she got to make the final choice. Am I gonna go or not? But she made the right choice. She said, I will go. And then Eleazar, the comforter, took her back to Isaac and they were joined in marriage. See, that's what's happening right now with the Holy Spirit. To some of you in this room, God is speaking to you right now saying, look, I want you to be my bride. And I've sent my spirit to convict you. And you know what's happening right now. You can feel it. You can feel it. You know in your heart, your heart's beating faster. You know God's calling you. All the excuses about why you can't do it are running through your mind, right? I'm not ready. I don't think so. I didn't know this. I just came to visit today. I'm not ready for this, whatever. It's all happening. You have the choice. He's not gonna make you receive. He's not gonna make you be his bride. He'll let you walk out that door and not do it. But I'm telling you something. Every time the Bible says we deny receiving the Lord when he convicts us, our heart gets a little bit harder. And the next time, it's harder to do. 
And if God is convicting your heart this morning, respond. Don't put it off. Say, all right, I hear the voice of the comforter. I'm now gonna give myself to you. Take me if you will. I, I give my heart. And then you give your life to the Lord. As we finish, I wanna do that. I wanna pray for us that we would just have a great week in the Lord, thanking him for what he's done and focusing on, on what God has done for us and rejoicing in what God has done for us. But for those of you who don't know him, to receive him and give you that opportunity to do that before we leave. So let's pray and let's do that together. Father, I wanna thank you again for what you've done through your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you that you gave your son for us, Lord, to die, that he rode in 2,000 years ago, but he didn't stop there. He was proven to be the spotless lamb and he went to the cross and died for our sins. And we're gonna celebrate that this week, Lord. We're gonna celebrate your death on the cross and your resurrection next Sunday. And we're gonna be looking this week at what you did, God, in between there when we come together on Wednesday. But Lord, for those of us that know you, we thank you for that and we rejoice and we remember and our hearts are filled with, with thankfulness. But God, for those in here this morning who don't know you and for those that may be watching online or listening by radio and the comforter right now has gone for a bride. The comforter is trying to convince them to come and to be married to the son. God, I pray if there's anyone like that in here this morning that they wouldn't fight it, but they would say, yes, I will go with you. I will be yours. And if that's you, it's as simple as this. Tell Jesus you believe he died for your sins. Ask him to forgive your sins on the cross. Tell him you believe his blood washed your sins away and receive him. Say yes to his proposal. Give your heart, give your life, turn from your sin and follow the one that died for you and the one that loves you and the one that has a home for you forever in the kingdom of God. Father, I thank you for the work of your spirit this morning and for all that you've done and we give you all the glory and pray it all in Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. If you gave your life to the